Good morning. Welcome to our monthly webinar, which is unusually on a Thursday today, but it's a little bit different, a little bit fun. Uh, I want to let you guys know the last webinar I did that we had our little technical difficulties. That's all been fixed and rectified and it's up and live on the website. That would be the one about osteoporosis, which is a very underdiagnosed and undertreated condition in this country. So watch that if you're at risk of osteoporosis or more likely you have a family member at risk of it. But today I'm excited to talk about bone on bone. Uh, and that is the title of the book I've been working on for the past few years. And what this book does is it kind of encapsulates what I've been trying to teach and let people know both in my clinical practice and here in my, you know, how I educate the public um, about more natural ways to treat your common aches and pains and orthopedic kind of conditions. And then the beauty of what bone on bone teaches you, the side effect of feeling better in terms of your achy, creaky joints and muscles and tendons and ligaments, the side effect is less risk of diabetes, less risk of Alzheimer's, less risk of Parkinson's, et cetera, et cetera. So basically it's sort of like a guidebook for um, healthy living, but really for the here and now, so you feel better today, not to esoterically add a few years of life at the end, which of course was our goal. We all want longevity, but really we all want to feel better today, be able to play with our grandkids, be able to do more and more, um, perform at work, you know, not hurt during the day, not be depressed and sad about pain. So that's what this book is for. It's to teach you and to let you have a little reference, kind of a guide to refer back and use as you, um, become healthier and optimize your aging and optimize your wellness. And yeah, thank you everybody for uh, joining in on this conversation. Um, I'm Dr. Meredith Warner of Warner Orthopedics and Wellness in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm also the founder of Well Theory, the Well Theory, which is my line of natural products to help you empower yourself to become healthier. And of course, the Healing Soul, which really started my journey of natural treatment for people. That's a shoe I designed years ago and got patented and we make that naturally helps people treat their foot pain. Um, and from that, everything's kind of just grown. So welcome to this talk. Um, this is my clinic in Baton Rouge. Just so you know, this book, Bone on Bone, comes from my perspective as a uh, surgeon in practice, in the trenches, in one of the most unhealthy states in the union. Um, and I see everyday people on a given basis. I'm not in an ivory tower of some elite academic institution uh, sitting in a lab doing you know, research on rats. I see what really works and what really helps people on a day-to-day -day basis. And I see the people that hurt. I see the people that can't even show me where their foot hurts because they can't lift their leg up to move the, you know, to get their foot close enough to their hand. I see the people that get out of breath just climbing a single flight, flight of stairs. I see the people that have to work two jobs so they can't get to the gym. So that was the purpose of this book was to help the everyday average American and you know, ideally the global population uh, to give you actionable, not necessarily easy, but approachable ways to improve your lives. All right, so this is generally a protocol, that's how I think of it, and it challenges our normal common orthopedic practices and will help you heal more naturally. Uh, but if in fact you still do need surgery or some type of orthopedic procedure, which I do every single week, um, It'll optimize your chances of outcome. So, so in other words, your result from any given surgery will be better if you follow this protocol. So the whole purpose is ideally to help you not need that surgery or not need that injection or not need that drug. But if you do, your outcomes, your ultimate results should be better should you follow this, this guidebook, Bone on Bone. That's the purpose. So I've organized it and broken it down into separate sections of the protocol of different aspects of your life. It all ends up being synergistic and working together, but you can sort of break it into pieces. And I'm gonna try to tell you how that's gonna be useful to you, what it's gonna do for you. And then certain very fundamental principles on which all of this science is based, which I've talked about probably ad nauseum in all of my talks before, and then some of the specific mecha mechanisms scientifically of how it all actually works. So you don't think it's just some crazy voodoo, I'm telling you. 
All right. So over my years in clinical practice, since I was a resident at Tulane in New Orleans and in med school at Jefferson in Philadelphia, since then I've been in the military, I've been in the private practice, I currently teach and am in the private practice on so both academic and private. And I've noticed over the past couple decades, I guess, goodness, that our society is not really getting better. We're not really getting healthier. Medical costs obviously aren't going down. More and more people go on disability. More and more people say they hurt all the time. The opioid epidemic newsflash has not gone anywhere. It's probably just as bad as it ever was. Um, and I just think that there's a different way. And I just want to teach people a better way to take care of themselves, their family, their kids, their friends, and become healthier because the medical industry is not really set up for that purpose. Um, so this, these are non-surgical options to treat and help with general aches and pains, stiffness, creaking, the fatigue, you just don't feel right. I think that I can help you with that. And this is the guidebook for that. And it's going to empower you in general to improve your performance in life, we'll say. So how do you interact with your family? How do you feel when you're cooking dinner? How do you feel when you wake up to go to work? All that I think can get better for you. It has for me following my own protocol. So hopefully uh, you will like this book and really even more hopefully for me, you'll use it and it will help you feel better. That's my goal. Oh, we have, hold on. Oh, Rebecca, thank you for that shout out for the healing soul. I love it too, but obviously I'm biased. Um, the book is available now. You can go to the website, thewelltheory.com. Now there is another website out there with a similar name. So make sure it's thewelltheory.com with Dr. Meredith Warner, MD. And you can, there's like a red banner on the top. You can get the book there and it's available really anywhere you can get books, but obviously we would love it if you got it off of our website. Um, but it is available now. It's not out in bookstores yet. I think that's going to happen like in the May timeframe, April, May. All right. So my protocol, we kind of broke it down into an acronym meds just to make it easy for you to remember. M is for mindset. E is for exercise. D is for diet and S is for sleep. So there's going to be a little bit of information about supplements and then of course references. So I read all the time. I pull journal articles on a daily basis and I try to learn constantly because the body of knowledge at this point is doubling almost every minute, if not faster. And so for a physician, for me to be able to help you effectively, I can't just stop learning because things keep changing. We keep discovering things. Uh, new papers keep coming out. So what I've done is encapsulate my years of research on how to handle things naturally into this book. And, you know, hopefully we'll update it as time goes on and I will continue to provide information to you. But there are references and should you want to delve into the scientific basis of what I put in this book, because it's been edited to make it a little bit more approachable for the average reader, the layperson. But if you're very interested in science, uh, you'll have some references to, to use to go a little bit deeper. But basically just remember meds and then I'm going to tell you how important each one of these are. And what I need you to remember is they all make everything else work. So like if you have a good mindset, the exercise, diet, and sleep is better. If you have good exercise, the mindset, diet, and sleep are better, so on and so forth. So this is basically going to teach you a framework to have a healthy, healthier life. Now, I uh, don't have a private chef. Uh, I don't have a fancy gym in my house. I don't have all of these, uh, like an oxygen tent that I can sleep in, like all the pro athletes do. Um, so what I try to do is make an approachable framework for healthier life for average people like us, like you and me, where we have to cook our own food. You have to go shopping for yourself. Uh, you may be in a food desert. You may be somewhere where there's no organic food around. So I try to make this approachable and doable and it's broken down into steps and it can be done slowly and incrementally. And I just promise you, as you add little steps from this book, they'll build on each other. And even just doing a few, you're going to improve your life dramatically. And again, of course, it's a source to which you can continually refer. So my goal is to give you less pain, make you feel less stiff, 
to have less creaking or, or crunching in your joints and to effectively give you better function. Because the real goal of an orthopedic surgeon is to improve function and reduce pain, right? That's, that's the only reason we're here. Um, and to fix broken bones, obviously. But I want you to be more active and I want you to be able to do movements and have functional fitness, like to be able to get up off the floor easily, to be able to pop out of a pool, get in and out of a car, basic things that you don't even think about, but a lot of people have trouble with. And I want you to be stronger. Strength is a hugely important thing that I think a lot of people forget. None of us should let ourselves get weak as we get older. And then you should feel better in general. And because you're feeling better and your body feels better, again, the side effects are going to be longevity and better health. Okay, so all of this and all of my philosophy and all of the Well Theory products are based on the fundamental principles that most of our problems in modern society and in society in general in terms of health are based on chronic low-grade inflammation, chronic oxidative stress damage to your cells and your DNA, and then this substance called advanced glycation end products, and the acronym is AGES. So those three things, I think fundamentally, are why your body doesn't feel quite right and why you might have brain fog. So just to back it up, just to do a quick review and refresher, metabolism is the source of many of these products, these free radicals and reactive oxygen species and inflammatory cytokines that give you the chronic low-grade inflammation, the ages and oxidative stress. So metabolism comes from the Greek word metabole to change. So really all you're doing is changing one type of matter into another type of matter and transferring energy. That's all metabolism is. So we take food that we find on the planet Earth, and we transform it into a type of energy that our cells can use, and then, of course, breathe out the waste, carbon dioxide, et cetera. And remember, we evolved on a planet that has oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, but also nitrogen, which is what's in proteins, and then photonic energy, which is really the start and the source of all energy on the planet comes from the sun, okay? So anabolism and catabolism, anabolism is building things. So some of our metabolism goes into creating cells, creating DNA, building muscle, building bone, and then catabolism. This is when we break things down to have energy. So the source of all energy is electrons. And you may know this if anybody's out there as a chemical engineer or an electrical engineer. Electrons are the common unit of energy really in the universe, to my knowledge. Now I'm no physicist, but I try to listen to some of their podcasts. They're fascinating. Photonic energy from the sun is converted by plants with a substance that you may or may not remember from biology called chlorophyll. Okay, they take photonic energy from the sun, which has traveled millions of light years, hits the plant, the chlorophyll harnesses that energy and is able to convert the energy from the UV rays into a usable carbon product in which they store the energy. That would be the stems, the leaves, the fruits, the vegetables, the tubers, okay? That is the storage form of carbon. And all that is, like a potato, when you dig a potato out of the earth, that is just one way a plant has changed photonic energy from the sun into a usable, essentially a battery, um, to store energy. Then we take that, we metabolize it and change that potato into adenosine triphosphate, ATP, which is our common universal currency of energy that is used by the cells, by the mitochondria, to allow us to do what we have to do in life. So energy is removed from food, from plant matter and from meat and whatnot, and it is oxidized, and then we get from that the electrons, which are then moved by structures like NAD+. You may have heard me talk about that. It's one of the longevity molecules. And FAD, these little structures take the electrons and move it from one part of the mitochondria to another. Then we can form ATP. ATP stores the energy in the phosphate groups. That's the P of the ATP and moves it around the body. And as the phosphate groups are broken off, guess what? Electrons are released and energy is moved around. Remember, all of this goes back to fundamental rules of physics that there's conservation of mass, conservation of energy. And that's how the world works. And that's how the universe works. So what you need to remember about your body or know about your body, you have something called a basal metabolic rate. And you are constantly making ATP all the time, which means you're constantly creating byproducts from that production, which is where we get the free radicals and the reactive oxygen species that then can go on to cause chronic inflammation.
and oxidative stress. As you're just sitting there watching this webinar, your brain is not just sitting there. You're using 20% of your daily calories just to feed the brain, okay? Even if you're sitting there doing nothing. And then likewise, 27% goes to your liver and your spleen. Remember the liver is just gonna detoxify everything all the time, it makes protein, and it's also converting um, usable food into things like fats and sugars and stuff. Your muscle, hugely important. The number one determinant that can change your basal metabolic rate is how much skeletal muscle you have. And I'm gonna go into later, and the book goes into great detail about how important skeletal muscle is. The kidney, the heart, and other structures also use some of your energy. So whether or not you're active, you still have to have some input of these photonically converted food substances into your body just to feed your brain and your major organs. 75% of your daily kilocalories are going to go to the brain, the liver, and the spleen just for basal metabolic rate, and 25% is used to maintain electrical potentials in the mitochondria, which we'll talk about in a minute when I talk about the electron transport chain. Meanwhile, while all this is going on, while you're just sitting there watching me, you are producing byproducts. I think of it like exhaust out of a car. So when you drive a car, you're converting the gas energy um, into uh, movement, into mechanical energy, right? And there's a byproduct, there's exhaust. Well, the byproduct of your body's mitochondria are reactive oxygen species. So you're making them right now. Hey, Janie and Jenny, thank you for signing on. All right. This is a little illustration, a cartoon of the electron transport chain. This is what's in the mitochondria that actually takes the electrons that came out of the food you ate and passes it through these little structures called cytochromes in the cell membrane. And they push protons to one side of the membrane, which is a positive charge molecule, and then keeps the other side of the membrane negative. Over time, you build what's called an electrical potential. So hugely positive on this side, negative on this side. And guess what? Nature, one of the third rules of fundamental rules of physics is chaos reigns. So nature is always going to go to the easiest, most neutral state of being. And maintaining a bunch of positive charge here and a bunch of negative charge here is hard. It's not normal. And the body always wants to equilibrate. So the genius of the electron transport chain is, and the bottom left picture shows you this, um, the little green thing is a structure called ATP ACE. That's another um, device, I guess, or object or system that's in the cell membrane. And what it does is it lets the protons on the heavy proton side, they actually fall through this thing because they want to get to the negative side and balance it out. As they pass through ATP ACE, ATP ACE acts like a turbine just like a wind turbine, just like a turbine in a, um, a water, you know, an old school water mill, just like a turbine in a jet engine. Passes through, spins a turbine, and guess what? Creates energy that's then put into a phosphate group and attached to adenosine. You get adenosine triphosphate. So it's a pretty ingenious little structure and system, and it's basically just fundamentally based on super basic universal pr principles of physics. But during the process of this, you do have some electrons that just kind of spin off and get lost and unpaired. And that's what causes oxidative stress, which damages your DNA, your cell membrane, and makes things like pain, makes things like stiffness, makes things like creaky joints, and helps things like uh, uh, the ages form. So all of this is fundamental to your mitochondria. So you have to have healthy mitochondria if you want your body to feel good. Hello, Denise from Texas. Kathy from Missouri. Well, this is exciting. And Lori from Pittsburgh, Three River City. Uh, but nobody here is really a Steelers fan, just so you know. Oh, well, good. I'm ex very, I'm very pleased to be able to have this book um, for everybody to read. It's funny. I kind of think of it as like, super common sense, like kind of what your parents told you, and we'll get into it. Um, but it breaks it down into bite-sized pieces that you can use to help make your life better. Because believe me, the medical industry and the food industry are not going to help you out. Only you can help you. And Karen from Arizona. I don't even know what time of day it is there. You guys don't have daylight savings time. What time is it in Arizona? All right. 
All right, so chronic low-grade inflammation. This is one of the fundamental reasons that you feel bad, okay? It is the cause, we think now, of most what are called NCDs in the medical community, which stands for non-communicable diseases, meaning you can't catch it. Like right now, everybody in Louisiana seems to be catching the flu. Um, you can catch things like cholera. You can catch things like um, bacterial you know, sinus infections, but you can't catch diabetes. You can't catch Alzheimer's. You can't catch Parkinson's. You don't catch cancer, although they do think some cancers might be related to viruses over time. But basically, all of what you think of as our chronic so-called lifestyle diseases are NCDs, non-communicable diseases. And we think the fundamental way these things develop is from a disorder of metabolism, dysfunctional metabolism. And if you've listened to my other talks, you know that unfortunately, 90 to 93% of Americans have signs one way or another of metabolic dysfunction. When you have metabolic dysfunction, when your mitochondria are not working properly, you're throwing off way too much exhaust for the amount of energy you're getting out of the food, and then you create inflammation. And this is present in almost most people in modern society in the developed world because of our terrible diets, our massive amounts of stress, our terrible sleep, and our preponderance of ultra-processed foods, and then also, of course, pollution in the air, the water, the soil, et cetera. Seven a.m. in Arizona. Thank you. Uh, we got Jenny from Massachusetts and Sharon from Nola, baby, New Orleans. Uh, one of my favorite cities in the world. All right. I know it is pretty cool how everybody around the country is watching. Thank you. Okay. So I just told you about NCDs. So here's a list of them. Cardiovascular disease, cancer, obesity, insulin resistance, diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. My grandmother had that. Um, she smoked. Uh, so these are complex chronic diseases that are multifactorial, meaning you can't just find one thing that we think caused them in general. It's really from the amalgamation of your diet and stress and lack of sleep, et cetera. And then you have this overproduction of reactive oxygen species and overproduction of inflammatory cytokines. Cytokine just means a cell produced protein that uh, has certain functions. And when you have pro-inflammatory cytokines, you're inducing inflammation, which in turn creates more oxidative stress. So inflammation is important in terms of fighting off a cold, healing an injury, et cetera, fight or flight if you need it. Uh, you want inflammation in some cases, like for instance, when you exercise, you want a, a little bit of inflammation because it induces the ability of the muscle to change and for you to, to develop aerobic capacity. What you don't want is the chronic low-grade inflammation. So this graph kind of shows you spikes of acute inflammation. That's normal. You want that but you want that periodically. You don't want this long, slow burn that keeps attacking your cells and your mitochondria. And that's what I'm hoping to empower you to begin to rectify in your own lives. Uh, Mary Coster from Maryland. Hello. All right, so we Americans and we people in the modern society of life that eat ultra processed foods and live a stressful modern life are in a pro-inflammatory state, meaning we are always inflamed. And this has to do with a lot of things that I'll talk about and go into great detail in the book, which hopefully will help you to understand more why I'm trying to tell you this stuff. <clears throat> we in America have a very high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. This is one example. You may have heard of omega-3s. You may have heard of fish oil. The reason this is important, omega-6s are present in things like corn and soy, right? The diet in America, since the advent of huge um, industrial farms and huge industrial feedlots where they feed these force-feed cows and stuff, corns and grains, to fatten them up, what's happened to the food supply because of the heavy preponderance of things like soybean oil and corn oil and all of the ultra-processed foods, and uh, the way they feed animal protein before they feed it to humans, 
is what we eat has become very, very filled with omega-6s and almost no omega-3s, if any. Even fish today that you get at the grocery store, most farm-raised fish is very low in omega-3 because guess what they're feeding those fish? If they're not feeding them other dead farm-raised farm -raised fish, they're feeding them the same crap they feed the animals on the feedlots. They're feeding them the corn and the soy and the whatever. So the fish aren't eating the algae like they're supposed to in nature, like wild-caught seafood. And so even the farm-raised fish are getting high in omega-6. Omega-6 embeds itself in the cell membranes and becomes a precursor building block for a pro-inflammatory cascade as opposed to omega-3, which is a precursor building block for a more anti-inflammatory and rebuilding type of a cascade that happens in the setting of injury or infection. So because of this, we have a very high level of reactive oxygen species. And then that gloms on and attack, attacks the cell membrane, breaks it down, destroys fat cells, damages endothelial cells, damages DNA, and does other things like that. In addition, in our modern society, we have sympathetic overload. So you have two autonomic nervous systems, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic is your fight or flight, and parasympathetic is more like your relax and recover kind of a system. The vagus nerve is important for the parasympathetic. We have sympathetic overload because of our massive amounts of cortisol, which is a stress hormone. We have low parasympathetic activity, way too much adrenaline, and there's no balance. All of this, and this, these are just three examples of the modern pro-inflammatory lifestyle, eventually cause your adipocytes, your fat cells, to become pro-inflammatory themselves. And the more fat cells you get, the more cytokines you produce that are inflammatory. And then also, the worse your diet is, the worse your intestinal lining is, and you get something called leaky gut, which lets bacterial toxins into your system, which also induces inflammation. So there's about, you know, a hundred different ways that we're hurting ourselves and making our body hurts and in turn giving ourselves brain fog and shortening our lives and making us unhappy. And I'm just going to give you a few tools you can use to sort of try to fight back. You don't have to live like this, in other words. <clears throat> Oxidative stress is free radical damage to cell membranes. Remember I told you the universal um, substance that transports energy or that is energy are electrons? Well, if the body and nature does not like an unpaired electron, every electron wants a partner as it spins around in the cell, you know, surrounding the quarks and the up quarks and the down quarks and the protons and the neutrons. An unpaired electron is not normal in nature and chaos will reign with that. So what does that unpaired electron do? It will find a partner no matter what. If your body doesn't have an antioxidant ready to go to grab that unpaired electron, it's going to go straight to the cell membrane and destroy the cell membrane. It's going to go attach to an electron it finds on DNA, destroy DNA. It's going to go find a protein and mess that protein up. It's going to do whatever it can do to find its partner so that it feels happy and it becomes a stable state, but it doesn't care what damage it does when it does that. So they're very selfish little things, these electrons. So our job is to give the electron first of all, to reduce the number of extra electrons running around if we can, but also to produce enough antioxidants to glom onto them to protect your cellular structures. So that when you hear the term reactive oxygen species, these are the free radical byproducts of your metabolism, which is, of course, dependent upon oxygen. So the Krebs cycle, if anybody, I know Mary Coster, who is a science teacher, uh, knows this. The Krebs cycle is sort of the first step of how we convert that battery, that potato, which the plant created from the photonic energy of the sun. We convert it into um, electrons that are transported by NAD plus and FAD to the electron transport chain. Acetyl-CoA is a carbon molecule. And basically all you're doing is moving carbon around. As you move carbon around in metabolism, electrons come off. And so what happens is acetyl-CoA will combine with a four carbon molecule. It's a two carbon molecule. You get a six carbon molecule. That passes through and carbon's pulled off. And guess what you do to that? You breathe it out, carbon dioxide. So again, we evolved on a planet with carbon and oxygen. So as it goes around, the carbon's pulled off, that energy is harnessed. You breathe out the carbon dioxide, the energy is passed to the electron transport chain, oxygen's the final electron acceptor in that chain, and, and it's a beautiful cycle, right? So we breathe off the CO2, which then the plants harness, combine it with the photonic energy of the sun, and create more usable food for us, et cetera, et cetera. But meanwhile, 
you're making free radicals, reactive oxygen species, et cetera. Who? Dat. Dat? Hey, Dat. Thank you. All right, so the electron carriers are very important. You, electrons, remember, you don't want electrons just running around your body on their own. You want to pick them up, put them in like a Brooks. You know how the Brooks cars carry money around? You want them protected. You don't want them to be able to interact with the environment. So they get onto what are called electron shuttles, things like NADH, FADH. This is why NAD plus is so important. This is why one of my products in the well theory is NMN. It's a precursor molecule to NAD plus. You have to have little carriers to bring the electrons to the electron transport chain where they go in and out of these cytochromes, build up that proton gradient that then drops through the turbine and gives you energy. You have to breathe all the time because this is always going on and you always have to have oxygen to catch those electrons and to help this whole process happen. Okay, the creation of ATP cannot occur without oxygen. Think about this, you can go months without food, you can go days without water, but you can't go much more than minutes without oxygen, right? Super duper important. And then ATP, of course, is your final currency. It's like your money in the body. The body's economy will not work without ATP. Rule? Ruel, somebody from North Carolina. Thank you for joining on. You live in a beautiful state. All right, advanced glycation end products. This is one of my personal uh, quests to try to figure out how can I reduce advanced glycation end products in myself and in you and what substances will help us do that. I think this is an ongoing project in the world. More and more work is being done on this, but these are ubiquitous and inevitable. This is the true cause of uh, body aging, if you will. Cataracts are formed from this. Stiff joints are formed from this. Stiff tendons are formed by this. This is one of the reasons you get placking in your arteries. So what this is, it's a non-enzymatic reaction that is occurring constantly in your body, meaning it does not require an enzyme. If you have a free sugar and you have a free amino acid or, an end, or part of a free amino acid exposed and the sugar gets around it, it will glom on react and create what I call a monster protein. And then that protein doesn't function the way it's supposed to anymore. That is an age. How do we discover this? This is what's called browning. This is the Maillard reaction. Anybody out there who uh, is into cooking, anytime you sear a steak, anytime you create a crust on a bread, anytime like the cheese bubbles up and becomes a brown and you get those savory smells and it's so delicious and yummy, what you have just done is harness the Maillard reaction, which is the creation of advanced glycation end products. Well, that's great for a steak, right? But unfortunately, it's going on in your body at a much slower rate of speed your whole life to all of your protein structures. This is why people's Achilles tendons get so stiff and creaky. I've actually operated on people and seen tendons that are kind of brown, kind of yellow. They're supposed to be white and shiny and glistening. But I've had people with so many advanced glycation end products that the, the structure of their collagen in their body just becomes ratty looking and stiff and dry. This is why you get wrinkles. This is why people that smoke a lot tend to look a lot older than other people. This is why diabetes is called advanced aging because diabetics make advanced glycation end products at a much faster rate of speed than other not people because of the hyperglycemia. This is why glucose control is so important. And I go into that in bone on bone a lot. A lot of our orthopedic problems, steep, stiff joints, creaky joints, crepitus, capsules that don't work right, cartilage that's not functioning right, comes down to advanced glycation end products. So what is the protocol? Remember the very beginning of this, I said meds, M-E-D-S, mindset, exercise, diet, sleep. Believe it or not, and I know this might sound hokey to some people out there, but one of the most important aspects of reducing pain, having better function, performing better in life, living longer is your mindset. You have to get your mind right or nothing else matters. More and more literature is coming out in every single subset of medicine, general surgery, orthopedic surgery, ophthalmology, cancer care, uh, diabetes care. More and more literature proves that mental health and mindset matters far more than anything else in terms of somebody's outcomes. So any surgery I do, 
I know the patient's mindset matters more than my surgical skill set than anything else. So mindset is massively important. And I go into that in detail in the book because I really think it's something that's been kept from you. You've not been allowed to know this knowledge. Everybody wants you to think you have to have a drug or you have to have a surgery that you don't have the power yourself. But I'm here to tell you, you do. Mindset is more important than anything when discussing health outcomes. And we get into that in the book. Okay. Health in the medical industry is merely the absence of disease. So as long as you don't have a uh, tumor, as long as you don't have a diagnosed Parkinson's, as long as you don't have an A1C of 6.4 and noted to have diabetes, you're considered healthy by the medical industry, correct? Nothing will be covered for you. No wellness products are covered for you. No preventative care is covered for you. The only thing that's covered for you is disease, diagnosed disease. That is the whole premise of the medical industry, the absence of disease. But for you and for me, good health is more than that. You want good physical health. You want to feel safe. You want social and emotional health. You want spiritual wellness. You want a personal sense of purpose and well-being. You want financial health, and you just generally want to feel great. You want to be able to play with grandkids. You want to be able to spontaneously go to an event with your friends. You want to be able to say, hey, it's a spring day out there. It's really beautiful. I'm going to go for a walk. That is health to me. Being able to participate in this beautiful planet, this beautiful universe with all your friends and family, right? It's not just the absence of disease. And for you to get to that good health that's not just the absence of disease, mental and emotional well-being is mandatory. You have to have purpose, meaningful contributions. You need to have connections. So social connections, massively important to human health. Coping with things, having good coping skills, massively important. Realizing your full potential as a human being, as Oprah says, live your best life. And then being able to perform. Who can perform if you ache and creak and you can't even get out of a chair, right? So that's the goal of Bone on Bone. The book is to give you tools to achieve this good health, not just the absence of disease. So remember I told you each thing is synergistic. Mindset is synergistic to exercise, diet, and sleep, and so on and so forth. Well, you can't have good... good um, mindset unless you have a healthy brain. You can't have a healthy brain if you have an inflamed brain. And so to get in a non-inflamed brain with mitochondria, and this is a pic electron micrograph of an actual mitochondria, how cool is that? All those little uh, lines are the membrane and embedded in those little membranes is the electron transport chain that is creating that ATP we talked about. If your brain's mitochondria is not healthy, if it's inflamed, if the uh, mitochondria DNA is damaged by oxidative stress, if the cell membranes aren't working right or they're stiff with omega-6s, then you're not going to have an efficient mitochondria in your brain. You're not going to produce the correct amount of energy. Your brain's 2% of your body weight, but uses 20% of your energy. And if your brain's not working right, then very critical what we call networks in the brain. Okay, networks are um, different connections between different areas of the brain, electrical connections and different neurons. And your motivation network won't function properly, so you'll have a lack of motivation. Your network that manages anxiety and stress and like the fight or flight response will not be functioning properly and you will have high anxiety levels. You will not be able to build up your own self-esteem because that network won't have the proper energy it needs and it will be inflamed. And you will have no ability to have self-control because your executive prefrontal cortex network is going to be diminished in capacity with a poorly functioning mitochondria with an inflamed and chronically inflamed brain. So good brain health is mandatory to good mindset. Good mindset is mandatory for good brain health. All of these things build on each other. We have a question. Jennifer just said that she is happy to hear I'm uh, emphasizing mindset. And I'm glad you're out there, Jennifer, and you understand the importance of it. And yes, the book is available on the website. It's already available today. Oh, the video. Yeah, the video, of course, is available. Um, there's actually a few other, I've given a talk on mindset before. You could even watch that one as well, just on mindset. Here, thewelltheory.com or warnerorthopedics.com is where you can find all my talks. And there's a talk just on oxidative stress. There's a talk on, you know, diet, like break, breaking down over time each little piece. Um, today, I'm just discussing the aspects of the book and not getting into too great detail. Uh, but 
mindset, yes, Jennifer, is very important. Okay, so mindset is important when it comes to eating the right foods. And remember, part of the meds, part of my protocol is diet. Well, you're not going to be able to handle a good diet or want a good healthy diet unless you have a healthy mindset, a health mindset. So what is a health mindset as it pertains to food? You need to appreciate good and whole foods. You need to know that they are your best source of micronutrients to reduce chronic inflammation, reduce oxidative stress, to make sure all of your reactions in your body, of which I think there's like 37 billion billion, some obscene number of reactions, chemical reactions going on every minute in your body. If you don't have the right micronutrients, they don't work out. Where do you get your micronutrients? Good food. Good fats are very good for you, bad fats are not. You need to start thinking about every piece of food that goes into your mouth, is it doing you a favor or is it gonna mess your brain up and mess your body up? You need to think of what every bite of food will do for your mitochondria, your muscle, your brain. And so fundamental to that is to cook real whole foods at home with friends and family as often as you can. Now, obviously, sometimes you're gonna have to go out to eat, sometimes you're gonna be on the road, Sometimes you're going to be at school, whatever. But in general, one of the goals of my book is to teach you the importance of cooking your own food at home with good ingredients. And then once you gain this health mindset, you're going to be able to maintain self-control because that neural network is going to be a little bit better in terms of its function and its ability. You're going to be able to maintain self-control when you're exposed to fake foods or the ultra processed foods that are ubiquitous in our environment and generally around us all the time, tempting us and trying to attack us. Oh, Jennifer, who we spoke about before, said she loves a supplement. She's been taking tart cherry for years. Me too. Tart cherry is one of the really good, solid sources of antioxidants and to help reduce oxidative stress and chronic inflammation because it's derived of a pigmented fruit, which is where a lot of what are called flavonoids are found, which are phytochemicals, plant chemicals that help control oxidative stress, that help glom onto those free electrons. Uh, I just had a question that asked if hypothyroid heart disease and what? And arthritis are interconnected? Yes. That is what I'm trying to teach people in Bone on Bone. Yes, arthritis is not a separate non-communicable chronic disease like you've been taught and I was taught when I was a resident and when I was uh, in medical school. And a lot of orthopedic surgeons still think that way. They still think it's like a wear and tear and overuse and injury derived thing, but it's not. It's the same fundamental problem that causes hormonal imbalances and things like that. All of it comes back to your body's just out of balance, really. It needs to have less oxidative stress and more antioxidants, less chronic inflammation and more just the ability to have acute inflammation on demand, less negative mindset, more positive mindset, less sympathetic overtone, more parasympathetic. Yeah, they're all related. And don't forget, there's thyroid hormone receptors everywhere in your body, including all of your connective tissues. And I love that you're starting to think this way. This is what I'm trying to get out there. The book will be available on Audible. Somebody just asked that. Yes. Okay. So you need to become aware of your thought patterns. And I get into this in Bone on Bone in the book. But basically, when, when it comes to mindset, there's what's called locus of control. Some people have an external locus of control. Some people have an internal locus of control. So like I have patients where they say, no doctors understand me and I will never get better. That is somebody putting their control outside of themselves, external. I have other patients that say things like, I seem to never be able to respond to treatments or recommendations too well. They are putting it on themselves. They have an internal locus of control. And then there's people that have stable or temporary sort of thought patterns. Stable would be somebody that says, I've been overweight my entire life and that's just never going to change. A temporary thought pattern would be, you know, I remember always being heavy, but I'm pretty sure that can change. You see where I'm going with this? Just changing your thought patterns is enough to start changing the neural networks in your brain and start making better health. Getting a growth or a health mindset. So global or specific thought patterns, global. Diabetes runs in, my fat, uh, runs in my family. It doesn't matter what I eat or what I do, I'm gonna get it anyway. 
That's a very kind of generalized global mind that mindset. A more specific and controllable one that's more related to that internal locus control is if you think, you know, a lot of people in my family have diabetes, but I also notice that they seem to only eat processed foods and they eat a lot of cake in the middle of the night. But I think I can change that for myself and maybe I won't get diabetes. So you got to start thinking big picture. So a healthy brain we already talked about is needed for a healthy mindset. Why? You have these molecules, brain-derived neurotropic factor, or BDNF, hugely important to cognition and brain health. VEGF, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, IGF, insulin-derived growth factor. All of these things function to make the brain work better and to have better neuroplasticity, meaning changing the neural networks and also healing and repairing neurons and even creating new ones. So you have to have reduced inflammation in the brain, reduced oxidative stress. And one of the fundamental parameters for that, for the brain, the only way the brain can detoxify itself and get rid of trash is with sleep. And that's why sleep is an important part of the protocol too. And we're gonna talk about that. Neurogenesis, the creation of neurons can happen. New synapses can form and new support cells in the brain. Everybody thinks it's just neurons, but there's things called glial cells and astroglial cells. These are the support cells. Like, think about this. When we, when we go to war, there's the soldiers, but the most people that go are the support staff, the cooks, the mechanics, the people that clean the uniforms, things like that. So your brain has a support staff too, and their health is fundamental to brain health. And then, of course, different neurons can be pruned and remodeled based on learning, creating memories, things like that. But to get your healthy mindset where you can change your thought patterns, you have to have a healthy brain. And what makes or break a brain? Okay, these, the left side is stuff that's good for your brain. The right side is stuff that's bad for your brain. Exercise is massively good for your brain. You will have great brain health if you continue to exercise. Environmental enrichment, meaning continuing to learn continuing to expose yourself to new things. This is when you hear about people learning a new hobby or taking up a new hobby when they get older. That helps keep the cognitive wheels turning. Uh, learning is part of that too. Good nutrition, fundamental to brain health. High levels of omega-3s, low levels of highly inflamed foods, and then good sleep, of course. Things that are bad, poor sleep, poor nutrition, getting sick, having illness, being depressed, chronic stress. Okay, chronic stress produces cortisol and low-grade inflammation, which in turn inflames your brain. And all of this is talked about in Bone to Bone. How do you get more on the left and less on the right? So the brain can be trained. You can train your brain. It's called end training. You could be trained to believe you have control or not. Okay, that's called learned helplessness. And you could train yourself out of learned helplessness. So you can reverse the negative conditioning if you've been conditioned negatively over time. You have to first become aware of your thought patterns, as we've discussed, and then sort of start to work with the thought patterns to change them. Some people need help to do this. Some people can do it on their own. But nobody can do it unless their brain is healthy and getting the good fats it needs and getting the good energy it needs and has healthy mitochondria. So your brain is, is magical. And I just you just need to trust in your own brain and its ability to help you out. Okay. Optimism. This is another part of a healthy mindset. Think about this. And this has been shown in some studies that have been done in the social sciences world. Remember, I told you I like to read a lot. I, I don't just stick. I read everything I can. 75% of success in life is predicted by optimism. Only 25% is predicted by IQ. Think about that. The optimistic people are always going to be successful and do better in life. Stress becomes a challenge. It does not become an obstacle. Problems become an opportunity and a challenge, not an obstacle. That's how you get success. That's how you get a health mindset. That's how you start feeling better. Two decades of study have proven this. More happiness, more optimism is linked to healthiness. The stroke risk is reduced up by, to 5%. This is independent of age independent of your socio-demographic status, independent even of your level of depression. Healthier lifestyles will lead to better optimism. More optimism leads to healthier lifestyles. That's why I wanna emphasize, and I try to emphasize in the book, Bone on Bone, that little baby steps matter. If you just get a little healthier, you can become a little bit more optimistic. If you just get a little bit more optimistic, you become a little healthier. And optimism can change your world completely in terms of how you feel and your longevity and your overall health. And your brain decides what you feel, which means you decide what you feel. There are different variables that can even modify pain. 
So look at this list of what goes into perceived pain. So remember I talked about electrons and um, that's a universal sort of energy packet for the world and the universe. The only way your brain has a thought is because electrons are moving around in the neurons and causing different things to happen. And then when you touch something and feel it, a receptor is stimulated and produces what's called an action potential and electrons move along a circuit or a nerve an axon and eventually get to your brain. Well, the whole way they're going up to your brain and the whole way they're going back down, they're getting modified and changed these signals. Emotions can change it. Your environment can change it, whether it's sunny, whether it's cloudy and uh, whether you're in polluted air or not polluted air, if it's cluttered, if it's not cluttered, your mood can change the signals. Memory can change the signals. Your expectations can change the signal, your experience and your attention. This is why people that get distracted don't feel pain because their brain has decided to ignore that. They're going to focus here. All of this is in your control. It takes time to gain it, but you will be able to. You can modify perceived pain in your brain. Your brain takes every variable into account, attaches certain values to certain things based on history of your brain, and then produces a perception or what you think of as pain or good feeling or happiness. And an inflamed and a tired brain can't get a healthy mindset and can't help you amplify good feelings and inhibit bad feelings. So what's important for a healthy brain? A good circadian rhythm talked about in the sleep and uh, section on, in bone on bone. Micronutrients, the diet section. Time-restricted e eating helps. And I talk about that too. Not just sleeping, but good sleep. Hydration, basic fundamental principle. Positive thoughts, we talked about that. Mindfulness and meditation can change what's called the inhibitory and disinhibitory pathways, descending modification and in, in uh, ascending modification of those electrical signals. And then stress reduction. All of this gets that fiery brain and reduces it so that over time your brain stays like the left brain, beautiful, healthy, plump, juicy kind of a brain, or the right brain dried out, thinned, atrophied, that's an inflamed brain, brain with neurodegenerative disorders. You don't want that. You want the healthy health mindset. So remember I told you exercise is hugely important to brain health. It's hugely important to everything, especially orthopedic conditions, especially how your joints feel. Exercise has been shown in study after study after study to be better than any drug or any surgery or any procedure we do for almost every non-communicable disease. If you can manage to exercise even just a little bit, you are going to be doing better than uh, really anything else a doctor or a hospital or a medical establishment can offer you. It's mandatory for good lifetime health and longevity. And of all the exercises, strength, I think, is one of the more important ones. So resistance training, something that's kind of neglected, particularly for women. Nobody tells older women they should be working out and lifting weights. And I think that's a mistake. All of us would do better staying strong and preventing what's called frailty. Yeah, this picture was a cartoon that um, AI created, <laughs> but I thought it was funny. Anyway, uh, that, that's very extreme, obviously. Physical activity, hugely important. So there's exercise and there's physical activity. Even if you can't exercise, as long as you have physical activity, you're still doing yourself a favor. Fidgeting has been shown to reduce all-cause mortality by 30%. Think about that. Just fidgeting. Just that level of movement or what's called non-exercise activity is better for you than doing nothing at all. So any body movement produced by skeletal muscle that results in energy expenditure is gonna benefit you, not just exercising. So cooking and cleaning, fidgeting, move, just moving around the house, working, assuming you don't sit at a desk all day, and then playing, playing with your kids, playing with the grandkids. All of this is fundamental to a healthy body, feeling good, having less pain, and having a long, happy life. You have to move. Okay, we have some questions. Amanda, I think stress causes many of my issues. What do you think is the best tool to reduce stress when working, living in a somewhat stressful environment? So Amanda just asked um, how to reduce stress when working and living in a very stressful environment because she believes stress is fundamental to a lot of her problems. If you think that, it's probably true. Um, 
stress is more important than most people think. So there was a great book I read a while ago, and I'll have to think of the name, but I think it was called The Statin Myth, or it was a book about statins. And what this author proved in the literature was the only thing that really extended life in terms of cardiovascular mortality uh, was transcendental meditation. Think about that. That extended life more than any drug or any heart surgery for people because that type of meditation allowed the parasympathetic overtones to predominate and overcome the sympathetic overtones. So there's less cortisol in the system. Cortisol causes chronic inflammation and oxidative stress over time. So transcendental meditation is a tool that you could use to reduce your stress, any meditation really. Simple things like box breathing can help reduce stress. That's when you inhale through your nose for a certain number of seconds, hold the breath, exhale through your mouth for the same number of seconds, hold the breath, inhale, hold, exhale, hold. And it's called box breathing because it's inhale, hold, exhale, hold, inhale, hold, exhale, hold. Just doing that very slowly and deliberately and just focusing on the breath allows your deep neural networks to take over and help reduce stress. So if you're in a very high stress environment, one of the first things you can do, you're right, is reduce your stress so that you can then take all the other steps in the protocol. Deep breathing is one of the simplest, cheapest, most approachable ways to do that. Progressive relaxation, which is a technique where you lay down and just focus on relaxing each muscle group. Yoga. Um, and then uh, exercise reduces stress too over time. So just taking a walk, especially if you can take a walk in sunlight and get good healthy UV rays, you know, wear a hat, obviously you don't wanna get skin cancer, particularly on your face, but UVB rays we evolved in and they do have a lot of health benefits that we neglect. So yes, yeah, stress causes pain, stress adds to heart disease, stress adds to all non-communicable diseases. So stress management is hugely important. That's a great question. Next slide. No, we're not allowed to go to the next slide. Hold on. Got more questions. Um, the site says pre-order. Yes, it's still pre-order. You should start shipping sometime. Or we the book officially released in May, but we should start getting in, in April. Okay. Somebody brought up that the um, website says pre-order. Yes, the book actually ships in May. We think we're getting our copies in April. Um, so right now, technically, we, we call that pre-order. Um, but it is available, and we're about to get it. So if you do a pre-order, you're going to get your copy pretty shortly. And what? Yeah. Okay, one more question, then we'll move on. Wow. And, um, she's since when? March 2023. Okay, Paula just sent in a comment that since March of 2023, she's been taking the supplements, the products from the Well Theory. Uh, she's changed her diet. I'm assuming she's sleeping better. And she's been able to avoid surgery on her shoulder, her hands, and where? and her knee. So that's awesome. That's my goal. I think that a lot of people believe surgery is inevitable, that bone on bone is an inevitable consequence of aging. And it's just not, it's a myth. And I want to dispel that myth and give you tools. And it sounds like you did it, Paula. So thank you. That makes me feel super happy. So she wants to know if there's a maintenance protocol for the supplements where she won't have to take everything. That's a great question. Uh, honestly, I'm still working that out and every uh, year learn more and more. I think, I think the real problem in our society is it's so hard to get the nine servings of fruits and vegetables that you need to get all of the micronutrients that you find in the supplements. I have that problem as well. Um, I think until we get our diet perfect and everything else perfect, some supplements are probably always going to be needed. For instance, omega-3s. Um, I just take omega-3s. I don't even bother with seafood really unless I know the person that caught the fish and where they caught it because I just don't trust the commercial fishing industry and I don't trust farm fish. Um, so I think there's always going to be a role for supplements. But yeah, we're working on maintenance protocols and we're working on different protocols, condition specific, things like that. That's a great question and something that... Um, when we produce that, we'll definitely get it out to you. But right now, I think unless you're able to get 
different vegetables, nine different types of vegetables and fruits servings to get all the micronutrients you need, you may still need to have some of these antioxidants and different anti-inflammatories um, exogenously or taken in supplement form. But that's a great question. All right, meds, mindset, exercise, diet, sleep, exercise. We've been talking about that. We talked about movement. We talked about fidgeting and non-exercise activity. Exercise's technical definition is activity that is physical, effortful, meaning you have to put in effort, and intentional, meaning you have to want to do it and you mean to do it. It's not just an accident. It's planned, it's structured, and it's repetitive. I put these two pictures because who doesn't love to watch curling? And technically that's exercise. And then I just thought it was so funny that these two boys got a cornhole scholarship, which is somehow a sport now. Um, and that is considered exercise. Um, so plan, structured and repetitive activity with the goal being the improvement or maintenance of physical health. But remember, if you can't exercise, if you don't have access to exercise or you're just so out of shape or decongestion or in so much pain that you can't exercise, remember, and this is what I'm talking about, making it approachable for the real person, any movement is helpful. So just do something and you're going to be helping yourself. And guess what? If you just do a little bit of movement for a week, I bet you the next week you could do a little bit more movement. It'll build on itself. The body has an amazing ability to get better. Most of us do not do enough exercise, me included. Here's a chart showing you in the green, uh, the lime kind of ugly green, I, not ugly, that's probably pejorative. That shows you 18 to 34 year olds, 41% of men in that age group do the appropriate amount of activity, 30% of women. And it just stepwise goes down, okay? So by the time you're in the 50 to 64 age group, men and women, only about one in five are doing what they're supposed to do in terms of aerobic and resistance training. And it drops off even more after that. And one of the things I wanna to impart to you, uh, a take home message of bone on bone and everything I'm trying to teach you guys is we don't, we don't feel bad and stop doing activity and get weaker and do less because we're aging. It's the opposite. We age and feel bad because we stop doing the activity. We stop moving, we stop exercising. Why? Because of our toxic lives. Work takes up all of our time. And when you're not at work, you have to pick up the kids at carpool. You have to go to the grocery store. You gotta make dinner. Who has time for all this? So what I'm trying to tell you is even just a little bit is gonna help you. I know in that time frame, that 35 to 64, where the exercise drops off, that's when most people are working and having families. So that's where all that time goes. So just doing a little bit, even during those years, will set you up for the later years where you can start doing even more exercise and building muscle. I personally, in my physical therapy gym, in my clinic, we have little old ladies who can barely get out of a chair, deadlifting kettlebells of 50 or 60 pounds now. It is possible, you can get stronger. We have a lot of questions. Okay. Lori wanted to know where can she um, get personal recommendations from me? So what people have been doing is calling my clinic and tr trying to set up appointments. Uh, our society is weird in that if you have a license, like I do, a medical, I'm a medical doctor, so I have a medical license, um, I'm only allowed to practice medicine in my state and the patient has to be in my state. Uh, so it's kind of an awkward situation. I am currently working on it. I've actually uh, consulted some attorneys, figure out how I can do this for people. Because if I were just an athletic trainer or a health coach, I'd be able to give you all the advice in the world. But because I have a medical license, if, if like, let's say you lived in Arizona and you called me up and I gave you recommendations, well, the Arizona medical community would come down on me and say I was practicing medicine in their state without a license. So people come to see me in my clinic from all over. Um, and I do have a medical license in Mississippi and Texas. Um, but right now it's really, you have to come to me until I work all of that out. My hope is have this all worked out by the time the book really hits the bookstores um, so that I have a way to do it that um, protects my license, um, but yet allows me to help people like you.
So Laurie has a good question. What is, what is a good starting supplement? Um, there's a few fundamental supplements that I think are important really right at the beginning and all the way through to the end. And that's going to be your omega threes, um, your D three, and then, uh, basic anti-inflammatories like the, the flavonoids, like the tart cherries, I think just that little group is going to be a great starting point. Okay. Another one. Okay, you can um, order Bone on Bone on thewelltheory.com. Can they do it on Warner Orthopedics? Not yet. So right now it's just on thewelltheory.com. We're going to put a link at the end of the talk as well. <clears throat> oh, and I'm located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I also teach for the Department of Orthopedics for Louisiana State University in New Orleans. My private practice is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Okay, so remember... Physical activity, not necessarily the repetitive, effortful, intentional exercise is really what matters. I love this graph. It shows you occupational energy expenditure since the 1960s, meaning the normal just movement that happens in work and in taking care of households. Because things have become so convenient and easy for us, remote controls. I don't know, some of you out there are probably old enough to remember having to get up and go change the channel for your parents when you were a kid. Uh, we don't have to do that anymore. Uh, some of us remember washing dishes by hand. Most people have a dishwasher now. Uh, some of us remember that you used to have to go to the grocery store. Now you can just pick up the phone and order something and get it delivered to the door. So our overall energy expenditure just keeps going down and down and down because everything is becoming more convenient and more technical and uh, technologically advanced. Household management energy has declined as well. And guess what the CDC does not track for us? The amount of sitting. Sitting is one of the scourges of society now and really just destroying us. You may have heard sitting is a new smoking. It's not technically correct. But sitting is really detrimental to you because it reduces any physical activity opportunity for you. And so just increasing basic physical activity. I tell patients to do this. If you have a job where you're sitting on your buttocks for eight hours a day, typing in terrible posture, staring at a computer, just set a timer and get up five minutes every hour and walk around. Um, that will give you 40 minutes of physical activity every day that you didn't have before, just doing that. Lori wants to know about turmeric. I love it. Curcuminoids in particular, which is the active ingredient. So my Joint Health Multi has 95% curcuminoid um, because to get it from the root, from Turmeric from curry, you would have to eat massive amounts to get the same benefits. So yeah, turmeric has a great track record. It's been used for thousands of years safely, highly anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. Uh, Thewelltheory.com has all of this. Okay, so there's strong evidence that shows that exercise reduces the top 10 causes of death, the top 10 most prevalent lifestyle diseases, the top 10 most costly conditions. There was a National California Institute study of almost, well, I guess 650,000 people. And they found with just zero to 3.74, what are called metabolic equivalents, this is an exercise unit, per week of physical activity, there was a steep decline in death risk. That's what mortality is. So what this amounted to was just brisk walking 11 minutes a day, a 20% lower risk of death all-cause mortality, just from that. So you hear all this stuff about how you have to do high-intensity exercise, and you got to do uh, zone four cardio this many times a week, and you need to have this many watts put out on your bike, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that. Sure, all that's great if you have the time and the ability to do it, if you're living a beautiful, you know, fancy life, but most of us aren't. Um, so for you to achieve my goals of bone on bone, which is just to make your body feel better and perform better in life and to be happier, just brisk walking 11 minutes a day is a great start. So that should be helpful and encouraging. And guess what? Some people can't even do 11 minutes a day. So what do you do? Start with 30 seconds. After about a week, I bet you can do 50 seconds. After another week, I bet you can do two minutes, so on and so forth. But you have to start somewhere. 
So the metabolic equivalent, remember I told you that's a unit of exercise, it's just the energy cost of any given activity, can also be expressed by watts. So you may hear all these workout types talking about their watt production, et cetera, et cetera. I don't do any of that. Basically, this is just a way that a scientific paper can break things down um, to be studied. It's a reproducible measurement. That's all a metabolic equivalent is the amount of oxygen consumed at rest. I threw this in here, you probably can't even see it, but I just threw it in there to show you that gardening can produce 4.4 mets or metabolic equivalents, and then low, at low intensity aerobic dancing does 3.9. So this chart was put in there to show you that, yeah, exercise generally produces more metabolic equivalents and you get more bang for your buck, but just doing things like chores, shoveling snow, light housework, heavy housework, gardening, mowing the lawn, that still is going to help you out. So don't neglect those things. Uh, we already talked about a lot on that slide. Go back one more. The Cooper Clinic study was interesting, about 10,000 people, and they found that each single metabolic equivalent of exercise capacity that you develop, that you're able to do on a daily basis, uh, is associated with a 12% reduction in death. This is how important exercise is. All right, so where do you start? Zone two. So anybody out there that doesn't know what the zones are, it's like one, two, three, four, five. Five is like you're exerting to the point where you just can't even think, you're working so hard and, and you can only stay doing that 30 seconds to two minutes. Zone two is walking briskly or running slowly where you're exerting enough effort that you can talk, you could have a conversation, but it's hard to do. That's zone two. That's how I think about it. <clears throat> the Lancet, which is a very esteemed journal out of Europe, uh, Healthy Longevity 2023 project, also talked about this thing called dual task cost. And what that is, is the ability to walk and talk at the same time. This is another reason zone two is great that a lot of the exercise type people ignore. So one of the goals that you should have as you age to have optimal aging and to feel good is to be able to walk and talk, to be able to hold a conversation while you're walking. Why? Because your brain has to do two things at once then. It has to function in terms of walking to maintain your balance, your position space, moving your legs and, and arms and stuff. So it has to function to keep your body moving. And then it also has to be able to handle a conversation. That is the dual task cost. And what's been shown in aging is most people start to lose this ability. So you have to be able to do zone two exercise cardio. This is why walking with your friends, little walking groups, it's probably one of the best things you can do for yourself. Or walking and talking on a phone, basically just having your brain do two things at once. What I used to do is I, I would take walks and listen to a podcast and try to learn. So it's critical to good brain function. And again, good brain function is critical to a health mindset and a health mindset is critical to a happy body. All this is going to build on each other. So zone two is a great place to start. So if you can, just find someone and to agree to take a walk with you just a few days a week to start, and you'll be doing yourself a world of good. Sarcopenia is one of the biggest scourges of our society. This is the loss of muscle over time. Uh, some people think it's inevitable with aging. I'm here to tell you it is not. This MRI shows you a cross section, like a slice of bread of a thigh, a thigh MRI. The left one where you see that big gray blob around the bright white circle, the bright white circle is the femur bone, the thigh bone, the gray stuff's a muscle. That's a healthy young person. And then next to it is an older person, sarcopenic person's thigh muscle. You just see all the loss of muscle and the addition of fat. So this is a weaker leg uh, that doesn't have that good, healthy skeletal muscle to help support the structures of the bone, but also to help induce brain-derived neurotropic factor to help your brain as you age. So muscle is hugely important for your brain health as you get older, but also for your basal metabolic rate, but also for how your body feels. So if you don't want to be the, the little old lady with the walker running around, you know, progressively deforming your spine because of compression fractures, one of the fundamental things you could do is build muscle. And I talk about that in the book. Muscle and um, staying strong, really. Um, is very, very important to how your body feels. All right, and here's a couple of real world ladies, not that cartoon I depicted before, who this lady on the top is 81. 
she bench presses 115 pounds. I mean, this is possible. You do not have to give up. You don't have to think just because I'm 80 and I've never lifted a weight, I can't possibly do it. Remember I told you about those thought patterns? Get out of that mindset. Your muscle never loses the ability to build on itself unless you have a fundamental muscle condition, of course, and your brain doesn't either. So don't, don't believe what you've been told. You have the power to change your life for the better. And it may start with a one pound curl bar and then you advance from there. You don't have to end up like these people. It'd be cool if you did, but you don't have to. You just need to be able to pop out of a chair. You need to be able to get up off a floor. You need to be able to reach up and grab things. You wanna be able to pick up your grandkid. You can do all of that stuff. And it just takes a little bit of effort and it's really not that much. And we go into the protocols in the book, of how you can get strong in a short amount of time with very little uh, uh, discomfort. Do we have muscle supplements? Um, I, get, I assume you're talking about things like creatine. No, but you can get creatine uh, elsewhere. I don't have that product yet because it's just so much creatine you have to take. I can't even take that much on a daily basis. Really, the way to build muscle is to eat enough good protein. That is fundamental. You have to have the, the amino acids. So a lot of people, especially as we get older, eat less and less protein. So I think eating protein matters, good protein, healthy ones, and then moving and using your muscle and your body will build its muscle. Um, and then you need, of course, the antioxidants and things to help the protein manufacturing process function efficiently. Go ahead. Okay, so this book is just gonna give you very basic, real world, real person, life recommendations, right? So the, the basic recommendations are, and this is supported by even the government, CDC and whatnot, aerobic, zone two or more, not up to zone, like zone two or zone three, 150 minutes a week is what's recommended. And then resistance training, which gives you strength, which gives you bone health, which gives you brain health. So we get osteoporotic. Remember the very beginning, I told you the osteoporosis talk is available. Bone weakens because of disuse as well. Um, so the more strength you can build, the better your bones are going to be. So resistance training, building muscle is one thing that actually makes your bones better and grows your bone. A lot of the osteoporosis drugs don't even do that. So these are just the super basic things that you should be doing or could be doing. Meds, mindset, exercise, diet. So diet is, you are what you eat. There's no way around it. Uh, the Mediterranean diet is an omnivore style of eating, meaning animal proteins and plant products, very heavily studied since the 1950s and 60s. I mean, thousands of papers have been written on this type of a dietary pattern. It's consistently been shown to be healthy. It's consistently been shown to reduce the number of non-communicable diseases, to reduce levels of inflammation, and to reduce episodes and incidences of arthritis and symptoms of that. So people have less pain, their joints work better, they have better healthier cartilage on this diet. This is the diet I am a fan of and I advocate for. There are lots of tribal thinking about diets, people that are, you know, fanatics about the carnivore, fanatics about vegan, this and that, and they may have very good reasons for that. But the body of knowledge supports the Mediterranean diet lifestyle, assuming that the ingredients are good, of course. Um, and you just can't argue with the data. And it's approachable and it's yummy. And it has more than just food. It also involves socializing and stress reduction and exercise. It's sort of a whole lifestyle. So Hippocrates, the so-called, or one of the so-called fathers of medicine, was quoted as saying, let food be your medicine and let medicine be your food. And guess what? That is, that's it. If you eat really well, you probably won't have a lot of pain and you'll feel better. I just had a patient yesterday tell me her husband went out of town and she was able to eat clean for a couple of weeks, uh, you know, kind of the way I propose in the book. And she really, in just that couple of weeks, notice she feels great. Her pain is diminished. She's able to do more. And it's just from eating cleaner. That's it. A fundamental premise of life. Remember, you're on a planet that evolved with the sun and plants. And we need to participate in that more fully. So this is an approachable, achievable, it's good for family, friends, and your work life, and it works, and it helps me help you. So one of the fundamental parts of the Mediterranean lifestyle is cooking whole foods at home with good ingredients with your friends and family and making it sort of like, 
your social connection time. So it's far more than just the food. And also in the Mediterranean lifestyle, daily walks are part of it, right? Socializing, limited or minimal alcohol, but part of that is the social aspect. All of this seeks to work together and make you healthier and feel better. I don't know if you know this, but there's a study that they've been following groups of people for about 85 years now out of Harvard to see what really matters in terms of a long health span. And one of the, only, well, really the most important thing is how many strong social connections you have. It matters more than anything. So one of the reasons I love the Mediterranean dietary pattern is it emphasizes social connections. So just that alone is going to help you feel better and help your brain with all of that mindset stuff we talked about and reduce brain inflammation. So it's all, it all works together. Next. Hydration. So one of the reasons plant matter is so good is it's filled with water. Hydration, remember you evolved with carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and photonic energy. Hydrogen is hugely important to how your system works. Remember I told you about that proton gradient that's created and drops through ATPase to create energy? That comes from water. So water is hugely key to making your joints feel better, to getting that stiffness and creakiness out. And part of that is not just slamming water all day, but eating water-filled foods, plants and vegetables, plants and vegetables, vegetables and fruits. Okay. So again, this just goes into it, it telling you about the study after study after study. Uh, just look at the bottom here, 23% reduction in getting diabetes if you just adhere to this type of diet. The real key to this is focusing on high quality, real actual foods that are found on the planet Earth and limiting factory produced ultra processed foods. So you wanna shop in the periphery of your grocery store and get as many fruits and vegetables and actual foods and you don't wanna shop at gas stations. That's where I'm going with this. So there's myths about this. Some people think it's expensive. How could anybody possibly do this? It's actually less expensive than spending on highly processed foods over time. Uh, some people say organic food's too expensive. Yes, you should always go to organic if you can, but any vegetable is better than no vegetable. So just getting vegetables and fruits, whether they're organic or not, is better than not eating vegetables and fruits. Large quantities of whole grains and wines are perfectly acceptable in this diet. That's not true. It's moderate, moderation is key, limited amounts of red wine. And then the whole grains have to be actual whole grains, right? Not just fake whole grains. Um, and what does a whole grain mean? That it still has a fiber. So this is a very high fiber diet. And then it, the last myth is that it's just about the diet. And I've already dispelled that myth for you. It's not, it's about the physical activity, the quality time with your loved ones and the social connections. And then reducing stress because of all of that. And then when you have stress reduction, to Amanda's point in the beginning, you have less cortisol, you have less sympathetic overtone, and that helps you feel better and prolongs your life and reduces brain inflammation. So remember I told you before that glucose management is important in terms of forming those advanced glycation end products. So having a diet that has a lot of fiber, um, a decent amount of protein and some good fats and isn't just heavy on the carbs like processed foods is going to help you maintain an even Steven level of glucose and you won't make as many advanced glycation end products. And then sleeping, which we're about to get into, guess where you burn the most fat is when you're sleeping at night because your body just goes into that um, metabolic, I guess, status where it's going to burn fat and not glucose all night. Maintaining a good mindset about food, having the Mediterranean lifestyle helps you do that. And then you get a healthy brain and then the healthy brain helps you to control your appetite. And then the key is to eat as many real foods as possible. If you just ate real healthy whole foods that grow in actual plants on the actual earth, um, it is really hard to get unhealthy. The problem is 80% of what's available to you and to me is ultra processed, factory produced, food industry advocated food. That's what we wanna avoid, the fake foods. So, What's a fake food? It is a false combination of fat, sugar, and salt, and it hacks those neural networks in your brain. So when you eat certain types of food, you get a dopamine hit. Sugar's more addictive than most, or as addictive as most illicit drugs, okay? So all of these foods are designed to hack your brain and get you wanting more and more and never being satisfied. And guess what? I think they've achieved their goal because the rates of obesity and chronic disease just keep going up. They're not going down. Now we have some newer medicines out there that are helping, 
But I think that in general, just look at the chicken on the bottom of the slide. There's one from Whole Foods, one from Costco, one from Safeway. Look how fat and big the chickens at the big mass produced areas are. They're filled with hormones. They've been force fed. They've been living in a cage. They can't even move. They've been uh, engineered and genetically engineered or bred to have massive breasts where they can't even stand upright and the chicken falls over. Those are the kind of fake foods that you don't want in your life. Um, that is not how your body was meant to function. You're always going to want more. You'll get addicted. You won't have good thought patterns. So the first thing to do, remember I told you, know what each bite of food is doing for you. Think about that as you eat these fake processed foods. And I bet you will naturally want them less and less. Real food is fine. Fake food is not. Real food's on top. Fake food's on the bottom. If you eat a diet like that on the bottom, that induces oxidative stress. It fills you with omega-6s, which become pro-inflammatory. You add obesity. Fat cells are pro-inflammatory. They're constantly producing adipokines that are damaging and cause oxidative stress and chronic inflammation. These foods are filled with chemicals, emulsifiers. They've been created with solvents, high heat. They're filled with advanced glycation end products themselves. And then you eat them and they go to your collagen and your tendons and your ligaments and your cartilage. So it's, and we go into this in bone on bone more detail, but it is, if there's one thing you can do to help your diet out, it would be to try to limit ultra processed foods. And that, that's the first step that should be taken. And cooking at home is part of that. Meds, mindset, exercise, diet, sleep. Sleep is the only time your body has to repair itself. Think about, I, I, I'm in Louisiana. I'm surrounded by chemical plants, right? Well, plants have what are called turnarounds. And that's when the place shuts down and everything is, is fixed, repaired, cleaned, and maintained. So they actually have to stop production during that time frame to fix everything. Your body is no different. Just like when you take your car to the shop, you can't fix your car and repair your car while you're using it and it's running. It has to go to the shop, take a break and get repaired. Your body is no different. Sleep is your time. It's your downtime. That is your turnaround. That is when your body repair can happen. That's when your brain can detoxify. And guess what gets repaired at night that nobody is telling you? Your tendons, your ligaments, your bone, your muscle, your cartilage. Shift workers have a much higher rate of arthritis and pain than non-shift workers. Why? Because their sleep cycles are constantly disrupted and they're not getting good sleep. Sleep is hugely important to how you're going to feel and bone on bone emphasizes this. If you want to avoid surgery and you want to feel better and have less pain and be less stiff, sleep is super duper important. And the timing of sleep, the rhythm that you create is very important. Monica just gave us a shout out. Thank you, Monica, saying that the CBD um, or our sleep gummies are very, very good for improving sleep overall. Her term was life changing. Um, you know, there's lots of tricks to sleeping well. We do have some supplements that help with this, but simple things like turning the lights down uh, to start engaging the melatonin system at night. I do it starting around five. Simple things like that, exposing yourself to sunlight as early as you can in the morning to get the cortisol, the normal cortisol going, things like that. So that's called circadian optimization. So sleep is important, but making sure you have a set schedule of sleep that really should match the sun cycle. Remember, we're on a planet that evolved with photonic energy from the sun, plants, and then ATP and electrons. And so there's a cycle, everything oscillates and changes. So really we should be sleeping when the sun is down and awake when it's up. Um, in America, we stay up too late. We have too many forced electronic devices that alter this normal circadian rhythm. And then people might go to bed early during the week, but then they party on the weekend or go out. It's really important to keep a set schedule constant. I call it like a constant routine, a constant routine protocol. And you want to match your eating cycles to your sleeping cycles. And I get into this in bone on bone. This gets a little complicated. But optimizing your circadian rhythm is very important to how your body's going to feel and your ability to self-repair anything that has gone wrong during the day while you're using your body. That can get fixed at night. You have to be in a fasted state and you have to be asleep for your body to be able to engage its repair capacities. So this uh, image on the right above the man sleeping is a study, and this is from a 2022 news report, 
Five hours of sleep could set the stage for multiple diseases. You hear people brag about how little they sleep. And believe me, I'm a surgeon, and that is the culture I grew up in, uh, that people brag about how, oh, I, I do great with two hours of sleep or three hours of sleep. Well, they're deluding themselves. It's not possible. The system doesn't work that way. So you should get seven to nine hours of sleep every night, solid sleep, to go through the proper stages to be able to detoxify the brain and have your cartilage and your tendons and ligaments repair themselves. Sleep is when growth hormone is released. It's when protein is synthesized. It's when your inflammation is regulated and more anti-inflammatory things can happen and less pro-inflammatory. This is when the parasympathetic takes over and you have stress reduction. At night, you're filled with mel melatonin, right? No cortisol. The opposite is true during the day. This is your downtime for the mitochondria. They don't have to produce as much uh, energy. They don't have to convert as much glucose to ATP. And then this is when all of the repair capacity happens. So one thing that I have noticed is in almost no medical literature, particularly orthopedics, is how well people were sleeping, the subjects in the studies. Um, nobody ever talks about it. I think they're starting to because this is becoming more and more obvious how important the circadian rhythm is. But one of the things I teach you in the book is that if you can harness a good circadian rhythm, you're automatically going to feel better because your body's innate capacity to heal is going to be engaged. So this is a great quote from Doris Day. Your skin and your whole body goes into repair mode when you sleep. She's right. People look younger, younger, have less wrinkles, are healthier if they have good, healthy sleep on a good rhythm. This is an image of cartilage above that. Your circadian clock regulates your DNA repair. Remember cancer that we talked about before, one of the non-communicable diseases? That comes from mutations in the DNA and different problems like that. Well, right now, every single human being on the planet has mutated DNA that has a potential to become cancer, but the body has a system in place to sense damaged DNA and repair it before it becomes a problem. When does that happen? Usually while we're asleep. And also requires certain micronutrients for that to happen and certain energetics, like your mitochondria have to be healthy. This is one of the reasons sleep is so important and circadian, a solid rhythm of sleep is so important. Your DNA goes through something called nucleoside, nucleotide excision repair, and that's from damage from things like smoking or air pollution, toxic agents, UV rays, and then there's faster repair of double strand breaks. Remember DNA is a double helix? Well, it'll break off every now and then because of our toxic lifestyles. That can be fixed, but it's only fixed at night and you usually have to be in a fasted state for good repair. Sleep is critical for your body to feel better, for you to be stronger and have less damage over time. So that so-called wear and tear and overuse is really just not giving your body a chance to repair itself. You have the ability, and I'm here to help you empower yourself to let your body do what it does. Your body has a system set up to fix itself. Just let it do it is all I'm asking. So, you know, I'm a huge Star Trek fan, or if you don't, you do now. This is seven and nine from Star Trek Voyager. And she always says resistance is futile and you will comply. I think if you follow this protocol of meds, mindset, exercise, diet, sleep, your success will be inevitable. It is yours. Your resistance to all of uh, this, your resistance to being unhealthy will diminish. It will go away. Um, each aspect of this protocol will strengthen itself and make you stronger. And it's not um, unapproachable. It's not strict. I'm not saying you have to go to the gym six hours a day and you can only eat this type of food and you must eliminate all of this and then you add on this and that. And you have to do this and you have to do that. No, it's just giving you tools implement them as your life allows. And what will happen is you will find your life will become more efficient. You'll feel better. You'll be able to do more and more and more. And uh, generally speaking, you'll have less aching. You'll feel less stiff. You'll hopefully get stronger and your cognition will improve. You'll have less brain fog. And all of this is with these simple common sense steps that you and I and regular normal people in the country can do on a daily basis. That's my goal. The order kind of matters. It's really important to get your sleep right and your mindset right, but it's not mandatory. Some of you out there, 20% of the country are shift workers. It is what it is. So for those type of people who can't really um, get a good circadian rhythm going all year, just do the other aspects of the protocol until you can. So 
that's why I'm saying this is approachable and each step works with each other. It's best if you can do it all, but it's not mandatory. Remember I told you just simple things like 11 minutes of walking a day is going to reduce your mortality by 20%. Uh, so everything is designed to help you feel better and avoid surgery. A lot of surgery is unnecessary. Some of it is necessary. Hopefully we can avoid all of the unnecessary surgeries and just feel better naturally. If you end up having to have surgery, your outcomes are going to be much better. And you'll feel better and you'll be, you'll be there for your friends and family as time passes. And that's just, that's all I'm trying to do is give you some tools for that. So the bone is called bone on, and I called it bone on bone because I can't tell you how many people come to my office and tell me there are other, another doctor told them they're bone on bone and they have to have surgery. And then we look at things, do a complete physical exam, analyze everything, put them on a better, healthier protocol for life. And most people avoid surgery. Most people that are told they're bone on bone are really not bone on bone. That's why I called it bone on bone. It's my guide, an orthopedic surgeon's guide to avoiding surgery and healing pain naturally. It's available now. You can go to thewelltheory.com. There's a little red banner above top and you can order the book now and it'll start shipping sometime April, May timeframe. So again, it's just a simple protocol that the everyday person can follow to get rid of achy joints, stiffness, creaking, pain to get stronger, have better bone health, and in turn have better brain health, and then reduce your risk of all other non-communicable chronic diseases. That's the side effect of feeling better. So I, this is hopefully a positive thing for you and empowering. It's not taken away from anything that any of your other doctors have done. It's just giving you a tool that you can use to help yourself. Oh, we have a lot of questions. Uh, so somebody is asking they're recovering from a total hip operation, a total hip replacement, and they're on the tart cherry and they want to know what else they could be taking to help their recovery. So your goal is to improve the health of your connective tissues and to get stronger and reduce your inflammation. So the tart cherry is a great start. And I take that at night because it has a little bit of melatonin in it naturally. Another thing you should be on is D3. There are D3 receptors everywhere. And if you don't have adequate D3 levels, the total hip implant is not going to seal to the bone properly. It won't heal properly. And D3 will help the connective tissue around your body as well. And normal optimized levels of D3 is associated with less pain. Another thing is omega-3s. If you could fill your connective tissue cell membranes with omega-3s, you will gain a certain amount of flexibility. All of the different receptors and channels in the cell membrane work better and you are less inflamed. So less inflammation. So I would say those and then things like turmeric, which uh, the earlier audience member asked about, is also a great way to treat sort of the whole joint disease that arthritis is. And remember, when your hip was replaced, they only resurfaced the bone, right? Remove the disease cartilage and put in that metal and sandwich, metal and plastic sandwich, I call it. But the joint capsule is still there. The synovial lining is still there. And all the ligaments and tissue that attach everything together are still there. And arthritis affects those too. So anything that reduces the inflammation, the free radicals in, in the whole surrounding joint capsule is going to help your total hip get better. So D3, omega-3 is turmeric, and then the tart cherry is a great, those are great things to start with. Somebody just thanked me for this information. You're welcome. I come from a long line of teachers and it's sort of in my blood and I do this really just to do it. Um, it takes a lot of time to put talks together, but I love doing it. So you're welcome. And I'm glad you're coming to see me next week. Hopefully I'll be able to help you. And what was the last bit? Oh, thank you. Paula, you're welcome. She just thanked me for the information and says it's been life-changing for her. Paula, that means a lot to me. Thank you. Hold on. I have some questions about protein in the past. Like, is there like 
Oh, yeah. So some people ask questions about protein, like do I prefer plant-based or animal-based? Um, this is when, when you're in the public sphere, you want to tread lightly because so many people get so obsessed about this issue. We're just keep, keep this in the back of your mind. Remember I told you transcendental meditation prolongs life more than anything, and that social connections, that Harvard study I talked about in the Mediterranean diet studies, social connections and having reduced stress and good friends and family. That's what really matters. Everything else is lanyap, as we say in Louisiana, or just the side dishes, okay? But protein is really important, or you can't build muscle. Everything in your body hinges on protein. Every gene is there to make a protein of one sort or another. So giving yourself the proper amino acids is massively important. Now, I'm an omnivore. I will eat animal protein, but the key is this. Animal protein is only gonna help you out if, if it's grass-fed and grass-finished, don't fall for grass fed. All cows are grass fed until they're thrown into a high intensity feedlot where soy and uh, corn are shoved down their throats. It has to be grass finished too. Organic is better. Cage free is better. Free range, wild caught. Anything that's as was intended on the planet Earth, okay, that's the kind of animal protein you want. If you're eating processed meats, ultra processed meats, ultra processed foods, uh, corn fed cow meat, that is not going to be so good for you. That's why some people strongly believe in animal protein only. I mean, plant protein only. Problem with plant protein is it's hard to get as much protein as you need in an efficient manner. And for people that are super busy, that makes a difference. Um, so that's why I'm an omnivore and why I don't have a problem with being an omnivore, but it does come down to the quality of the protein. Yes, you're welcome. Somebody just thanked me for not pushing pills. Uh, and I assume you mean pharmaceuticals. Yes, I agree. Um, I don't push them. And just another little thought process for you in terms of pharmaceuticals. There are some great drugs out there. I prescribe drugs every day in my clinical practice for people. But know this, the FDA pulls back 5% of approved drugs every year for unintended side effects. And also, no drug is studied for its effect on the mitochondria. Nobody knows what they're doing to you, to your mitochondria, because that's not considered anything that the FDA needs to pay attention to. So if you can avoid prescription pharmaceuticals, you probably should if you can. Now a lot of people can't because you have certain conditions. But my goal is to let you find your body's way to make yourself healthy. And bone on bone should give you some tools for that. One more. <laughs> one lady found out about you. Sorry, I'm trying to lose your word. She just found out about you. She has osteoarthritis in her knees, but she's not take. She refuses the cortisone. Um, what are your thoughts on infrared treatments on knees? Okay, somebody's asking me about my thoughts on infrared light therapy treatment on knees for arthritis and knee pain. It's somebody that's trying to avoid corticosteroids, which you should try to avoid those because they damage cartilage over time. Now, I inject steroids in people when necessary, but I really try to avoid it if I can. Infrared therapy has a great body of literature behind it. So the way that works is it's a different light wave that is a longer, slower light wave, and it's able to penetrate through skin, and then inside your body are certain protein structures that respond to photonic energy. So that will respond to this particular light wave and it'll turn on certain genes, turn off certain genes, um, amplify certain proteins, inhibit other ones, induce some level of anti-inflammation and reduce pro-inflammation. So I'm a big fan of infrared light therapy and I've recommended it to patients. I've recommend they get the little wands when they're healing their wounds to try to help the wound heal quicker. So I think if you can, you find a good device and you can do it, absolutely do infrared light therapy. There's a ton of literature behind photonic energy and its power. I think a lot of physicians poo-poo it and think it's crazy, mostly because they don't really understand the physics of wavelengths and how they work and photonic energy and electrons and how the body is built to respond to that. Oh goodness. Somebody just asked about stem cells. So this is a touchy subject in medicine. Um, most stem cells, we've been told, that practice clinical medicine with a license. Um, we're not allowed to 
use anymore. The FDA doesn't want us to. Uh, the only way I can give people stem cells really at this point, to my knowledge, is if I harvest them from that person's bone marrow and put it into a different part of that person's body on the same day, um, which I can do. But now you got to dig into somebody's bone to get their bone marrow, which is kind of painful. Um, but stem cells are being studied everywhere, mostly in other countries, because our regulatory environment is um, uh, kind of not pro stem cell, if you will. Stem cells are hugely powerful, massively important, and I think will change the world once we're allowed to use them. Um, a stem cell is just a cell that has potential to become something else. So like if you put a stem cell in a cartilage environment, it has the potential to become a cartilage forming cell and a healthy one. If you put it in a muscle, it has a potential to become a muscle forming cell and a healthy one and so on and so forth. That's a beauty of stem cells. They do work. I have used them big fan. But right now in our regulatory environment, the only way I can really do it for people is to drill into their bone, suck out the bone marrow, spin it, and, and then inject it where it's needed. But if you have the ability to get them somewhere and, and you know it's a good source and it's safe, then you should consider it. All right. So we'll try to answer as many questions as we can going forward with different talks and, and different blogs and things like that. But again, thank you so much. Uh, Bone on Bone is available to be ordered on thewelltheory.com right now. And it is my guide to you to avoiding what I do, which is orthopedic surgery. So basically, I want to put myself out of business, if you will. Bone on Bone is an orthopedic surgeon's guide to avoiding surgery and healing naturally because your body is built to take care of itself. Let it do it give it the tools it needs and your body will surprise you and you will feel better, have less aching joints, have less pain, you won't creak as much, you'll be able to move better and more fluidly and be stronger. So thank you so much for listening and go enjoy the rest of your day.